This episode of Engineering the Future is brought to you by Member Perks for OSPI, helping engineers and their families save money on everything from electronics and food to apparel and home improvements. New perks are being added all the time. Visit Member Perks for OSPI before you shop and enjoy exclusive savings from brand names and local favorites online, curbside, and in store. This podcast is brought to you by OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, the advocacy body for professional engineers and the engineering community in Ontario. Welcome to Engineering the Future, a podcast presented by the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. I'm your host, Jerome James. Today, I'm joined by Kadra Branker, professional engineer, an OSPI member who works at the Independent Electricity System Operator. Thank you for joining us today, Kadra. What is the ISO and what do you do there? Thank you for having me here today, Jerome. So the ISO is a nonprofit organization that manages the reliability of the province's electricity system. Its mandate is to ensure the electricity is available when and where and when it's needed. If you think of an orchestra, the ISO is like the conductor ensuring the various players in the market are working well together today in real time, as well as planning into the future. So if you think like the next five minutes, the next 20 years. So in true fashion, you know, the supply needs to meet the demand. Okay, interesting. And uh, what is your role at this operator? So that's perfect. So if you think about planning, energy efficiency is a big part of that. Energy efficiency continues to be the lowest cost resource in the market. And that's where my role comes in. I'm a program advisor that oversees the delivery of the largest energy efficiency program in the province, and it's called the Retrofit Program. So in program delivery, right, I have concepts and targets that are set out for the program, and I work with my colleagues and various vendors to make those a reality in the marketplace. Interesting. What's the, what's the history of energy efficiency uh, programs, uh, incentives, that whole, that whole thing? Uh, how long has that been a thing in Ontario? Oh, for sure. So electrical energy efficiency um, has been delivered under the Save on Energy brand for, for a really long time. And in fact, like perfect timing. Um, it's our 10-year anniversary this year. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a long time. Yeah. And it's like, so, so over the past decade... We've been able to save um, over 16 terawatt hours of energy um, or enough to en- enough energy to power 1.8 million homes for a year. And was there a need for this savings? Uh, where did this concept come from? Is Ontario the only ones doing it or is there programs like this across Canada? Oh, absolutely. So um, energy efficiency is actually a best practice when you think about that, right? So if you think of a market and you have supply and demand, not only do you just want to keep building things out, but you also want to make sure that we're using everything efficiently. So right. Ontario um, does this. A lot of other jurisdictions in North America do this and places as well in Europe. And okay. this year, actually, we're going to continue doing it. So we're excited to continue our commitment with a new four-year framework this year. And, uh, you know, despite the challenges of the pandemic, we're still on track to get really close to some of our targets. You know, hopefully cross fingers, you know, we keep moving ourselves out of this pandemic. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's it's definitely an important um, part of that planning piece. And actually, and in OSPI, I think one of the things you might have heard is that in the short term, we might have enough energy, right? Mm -hmm. But even though in the short term, you know, we have enough energy, we always have to be thinking about the future. So changes in demand for electricity, you know, changes of the supply mix in the future, that's something we have to plan for right now. An example is, you know, think about electric vehicles, right? And the increasing demand for charging infrastructure. That's going to continue to increase our demand so we need to kind of work that in there. And the energy efficiency space right now is where, you know, we're looking at other jurisdictions. It's becoming a best practice. And we're taking our time right now to reshape and evolve our programs so we can continue to transform the market. That's very, that's very interesting. What, what were kind of the pillars of this program before 
And how are you guys adopting for the future? Have the priorities changed? Um, has the market changed? What what has prompted these these uh, framework changes in the last little while? Absolutely. Um, so one of the first parts of you know understanding the need for the framework, of course, um, part of that is the support of government and whatnot. Is you know what do we need at a given time? So there are times when demand and supply and those planned, those forecasts are, you know, wide and we have to do a lot of conservation. And then there are times when it's, you know, a little bit closer and we don't need as much. So right now in the short term, we might not need as much, but in the long term, we see that expanding. So we want to make sure that we're spending the money and we're being cost effective when we need to. So in the past where programs might have just been like, all we were trying to do is try to you know, start that culture of, of right. energy efficiency, you know, people are getting it now, you know, the prices of things are going down, we're starting to see that market transformation. So we need to continue to drive changes to make it more competitive, to continue to be cost effective, because at the end of the day, it needs to benefit all Ontarians, right? And right now, I'd say one of the important parts is us targeting system needs across the grid, it's not the same thing everywhere. There's some places where there's a lot of boom and, you know, the supply can't match it. In other places, there's excess. So we have to do that planning, not just on a holistic level, but also on a regional level. Can we um, revisit that 16 um, terawatt figure? And what does that actually entail? Uh, are we changing behavior um, how much invest private investment is coming into creating that 16 terawatts uh, without this incentive program, where would we be in Ontario? Honestly, I can't. I do not have a full crystal ball and I haven't been here for that whole time. <laughs> um, but if I were to think about, um, you know, where would we be without, without those incentives, it would mean not creating some of those jobs and some of those um, suppliers and manufacturers that have focused on mm -hmm. creating energy efficient technologies, I mean, think about LEDs and CFLs. Like there was a whole, you know, you moved from incandescent bulbs, you know, we moved to CFLs, we moved to LEDs. And, you know, something has to help you drive that. That's the only time when a market agent like ourselves would intervene is to try to drive that. Similarly with behavior. I mean, even, even if you tie, think of energy efficiency and think of the three R's, you know, it takes time to put in those education programs for people right. to become aware to even say, you know what, this is this is important to me in my organization um, right now. And actually, I'd like to take the moment maybe to even think about how diverse this program is. So this the retrofit program is a business program, but it's a very diverse one. I mean, we have participants that are hospitals, we have social housing, um, you have industrial facilities. Uh, you have Very your grocery stores, et cetera, right? You have right. lots of different people in the market and Jerome and yourself like at work <laughs> right now. Is energy mm -hmm. efficiency important to your company? I feel that there's this new wave of realization that efficiency is a bottom line driver and it's not just greenwashing. It's not just, oh, we need to do something to check a box. It's literally... Corporate, I can speak a little bit to um, the industry that I'm in. Um, everyone wants to know uh, well to wheel carbon footprints of their machinery and, and their products so that they can brag to their, their donors or their board that they're actually making a change and making a difference. Um, every piece of a car that you can understand the, uh, the, the amount of carbon that goes into it. Um, is a selling point onto itself, and it, it drives uh, numbers. Uh, whether or not you can hire more and put improve your output, uh, definitely. It. I feel that that kind of philosophy. It's not a a left or right thing anymore. It's a bottom line driver type of thing right now. And that's really awesome to hear. And I think that's mm -hmm. the point, right? It's not just this extra other thing. It's absolutely integrated as part of our lives, part of our businesses. And it's, it's more than just reducing the energy. There are all these other added benefits that you can get sometimes, whether right. it be you know, better lighting so that it's a safer environment or you know better indoor air quality with a better HVAC system or more comfort. 
because you have the right temperature set points, there are a lot of other benefits beyond it just being energy efficiency. Absolutely. And um, so how are some of the things I, I'm more familiar about uh, the incentive to upgrade machinery or um, uh, be more energy efficient around in an industrial setting. What are some of the things that we can do from a, a personal uh, perspective to be more energy efficient in our everyday life? So I think there's a, there's a lot of different things, but I would say the first place to start is, well, knowledge is power, right? So yeah. understanding your energy bills, don't just pay them. <laughs> Take a look at them. Understand how much you actually use right now. And then if you know where you're at right now, then you're going to actually be able to see the benefits of the actions that I'm about to talk about kind of over time. So the first thing I like to think about is maybe just taking that time to think, what are some alternative ways of doing things to help me save energy? For example... I try to dry, like air dry my clothes, you know, hang them up. I have a little rack and do that instead of using the laundry dryer. And honestly, sometimes that's even better for your clothes. They last, they last longer. And then the next thing is that we have a lot of tools and technology now. There's so many. So, you know, how can you use those to help you on your journey to, to using less energy? So, for example, a lot of us have programmable thermostats right now. So if you were to use that, there are certain schedules that you could set and you can make sure that you're heating and cooling only when you need to at the amount that you need to. Right. <clears throat> Absolutely. And those new smart meters are amazing. Ox occupancy sensors, it learns your your habits and your when you're inside and when you're not and it adjusts accordingly. It's, it's a real lifesaver when you, you don't want to think and just save. And get a smart meter. Yeah. And even more, it's like some of them, they're connected to your phone now. And so you're like, you, you've left, you've gone on vacation. And you're like, oh, wait, do I really need to be heating it up all the way while there's nobody there? You can turn it down. And on your way back from vacation or from your trip, you can just turn it back up. So it's warming up. You know, you can still achieve energy efficiency and still have comfort. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. At Ospi, we're here for you making sure government, media, and the public are listening to the voice of engineers. You can learn more at ospi.on.ca. In your role at the ISO, what are some of the things that you bring to the table as an engineer? Thanks, Jerome. That's, and that's a good question. It's, it may not be typical to find an engineer in a department called policy, engagement, and innovation, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what I bring as an engineer really is critical thinking, fact-based decision-making, and a culture of duty of care to society. I like to ask questions about why we do things a certain way, um, just to discern if they really are the best way. I think this goes back to um, my roots and just trying to solve complex problems and, and trying to you know, gain the best, you know, best outcome that you can um, for the situation. I definitely love learning and I enjoy challenges, especially working with both technical and non-technical um, professionals, because it brings so many perspectives to the table. And really that diversity of perspectives is what leads to better outcomes. And that's what I like to, you know, pull all of those inputs together to, you know, create an impact that's, that's important for society. Interesting. Do you work with other engineers in, in your department or is it you do you liaise with engineers outside as a cohesion within the organization? Uh, so I do have to work with um, engineers both inside the organization and outside of the organization. So as I mentioned before, I work with certain colleagues and I also work with um, various vendors. So we have vendors in the market who help with and who have to be experts in the technologies when they're reviewing the applications or helping applicants apply. So I work with them from that perspective. And then internally, we have to have people who design some of these measures, review them, you know, continue to evolve our programs. So I need to be able to take the, you know, the technical requirements and translate them into that program, translate them to our vendors, but then also translate it to the market. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I don't think uh, I was full, tr full, gave full transparency earlier, but as an energy manager in my day-to-day -day role, I interact with the retrofit program on a daily basis. So. Uh, 
this is very, this is hitting home very closely, this whole conversation that we're having today. Um, very interesting, your insights on, on these, these topics. Um, I want to talk a little bit of, you know, the elephant in the room, uh, COVID-19, the pandemic. How has this time affected um, uh, program delivery, uh, the market, uh, the efficiency program? Uh, in general? That's a really good question. And um, I would say my program has been impacted differently than other programs, and it depends on the delivery model. For some of the programs where it heavily depended on sort of like in-home audits, for example, those ones definitely had to be pulled back and go to a waiting list because we wanted to wait till it was safe enough to do so. And we didn't want to impose that upon upon, um, people at home trying to deal with the multitude of other issues um, with this pandemic. But from right. the business side of things, I think what was really interesting from the seat of being in a province-wide program is seeing almost the boom and bust of different businesses across the table. So honestly, as a program, we did much better than we would have expected we would have done as far as still being on track to meet the targets that we need. And that's because there were certain industries that continued to boom despite the pandemic. For example, okay. yeah, and it's like you'd be absolutely surprised. I mean, people took advantage of opportunities when schools were closed. All of a sudden, you had schools saying, "You know what? I don't have to wait, you know, for an outage or a time period for when there are, if there's nobody in the school, let's get in there and do those projects that we wanted to right. get done." Right? Because that's a big issue with scheduling. When do I do an upgrade? When you have classes and and people um, week to week. Uh, scheduling could be hard for these retrofits. Exactly. So people, I would say I saw like the resiliency in the market in a way where people took advantage of opportunities when they could. And then they were also upfront with us when they couldn't. And that means that we actually took some some opportunities then to tweak some things in the program to help people still be able to engage with us. Um, so for example, we require photos of the existing equip- equipment in the initial application. But because you have in you know in person restrictions like you know, right at the get go, we decided well maybe there's other information that we could use for the purpose of reviewing the initial application, and then we can delay those photos to when the actual installation is taking place. You could take a photo of the existing thing, take a photo of the new thing when it's installed, because you're only going to have an installation take place when it's safe enough to do so. Mm-hmm. So instead of having to make someone try to get someone in there more than once then they could they, they could just do it once. And so those are the kinds of things where, you know, we try to learn with other jurisdictions. We try to work with our own vendors, you know, to make sure they're following health and safety protocols. And then we try to like relax things where we could without affecting program integrity. Right. I also want to ask you about um, the, where, where we stand in the world of energy efficiency uh, compared to our competitors, uh, I don't know, California, the, the Europe, uh, how do we stack up in this conservation game? Um, are we a world leader or are there jurisdictions that we can learn from? Um, how, how, do, how do we stack up in this game? So I have to say that sort of the energy efficiency game is, is very local and very personal. And I wouldn't say you could really do an apples to apples comparison to say, okay, well, this com- you know, place is better than that place. But what it is, is, you know, if we look at where we want to be, because it, it really is tied to the system, you look at where you want to be and are you on your way to doing that? And, you know, we're doing a great job of being on track to do that. We're also, we also have a lot of other ambitious projects and things that we're wanting to try to do to change the programs to be either more cost effective or more competitive to try different business models um, for different programs. So in some ways, we're a leader in trying out some of those new pilots for those different types of programs designs. Mm. Sometimes we do something different from what everyone else is doing. You know, we're trying a prescriptive only version of the retrofit program um, right now. And then we're taking the time to redesign what the custom side of things might look like, perhaps not even in this program, but maybe in an open call offering um, where different um, participants can bid in, like into an auction, for example, or bid 
you know, various proposals. So we are continuing to toy and experiment with things in a controlled manner um, to right. kind of figure out again, what's going to bring the best value and the best results for the grid. Great. And uh, do you see any hiccups along the way with the proliferation of electrification of, of travel, um, the uptake of EVs. Um, if you had that crystal ball vision that you referenced earlier, uh, what do you see that's in store for Ontario in the next 10 to 15 years um, when it comes to energy uh, and sustainability? Honestly, it's the Biggest thing I could say, maybe probably with certainty for the crystal board, is it's going to be exciting. <laughs> it's definitely going to be exciting. There are a lot of different projects um, on the go across the board from an electrical side, kind of the gas side, there's storage, there's a whole, a whole bunch of different things where um, a lot of different parties are coming together to tackle those challenges. So I'd say it's not like things are going to blow up in a long time because that's the whole point of us engineers being around and as well as our other counterparts where we're sitting down and planning ahead. So we are running various types of models, trying to figure out all of the worst case, best case scenarios and where can we get those things and where, how do we come up with a plan to, to get those resources, you know, in, you know, in those timelines. So we do have sort of high and low demand scenarios um, for electrical vehicles. And, and we're, we're figuring that out. We're working regionally. We're working with other distributors and, and, and honestly taking that complex problem, breaking it down and figuring out what we need to do. But for sure, it's going to be exciting and quite, quite an evolution in the next 10 years. Great. And do and you think that that's uh, policy driven uh, from a local level, from a federal level? Um, you know, how does policy uh, affect the uh, the trajectory? Um, I know that uh, the city of of Toronto have some aggressive targets to eliminate uh, what is it um, internal combustion cars in the inner city by twenty fifty. Is that a is that a correct statement there? Um, I can't remember the exact specifics, but definitely in the, um, to basically to go to zero, to go to net zero, there right. are a lot of aggressive pieces for in the city of Toronto's plans, um, including even like the densification of the downtown and, and a whole other host of things where from at least the electrical point of view, if you have a lot more people in the same space, there's still a lot of, there's a very dense need for electricity. So we still need to plan for that as well. If we have a lot of electrification, like you said, you know, again, that's going to be another need. Um, but going back to your question about sort of the policy and is it important? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, it definitely gives it. It definitely sends that signal to the market and to other players that we're serious and we're serious for this time period, depending on how long. So similar to how we have now a new four year framework, it's like we're serious. We're doing this for the next four years when um, there's government policies or funding available. So we do, there, there are federal signals and provincial signals that we're getting around um, storage, for example, um, climate change objectives. And that's where you're getting into those net zero challenges and timelines um, right. being part of the Paris Accord. So, so we definitely, definitely those Parts of policy help give people the certainty to invest in those types of technologies. Great. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, wish you a belated happy International Women's Day. Uh, how did you celebrate last uh, yesterday? Um, a lot of colleagues at work um, cheered each other on. I would say for International Women's Day. I would have liked to have attended. Um, I know Step Up had a cool coffee side chat where they, you know, integrated a whole bunch of people and they're trying to um, kind of elevate women in the workplace. And then there's also kind of some fun um, shirts that that people have wore. You know, science and technology is where women are supposed to be, and and things like that. So I, you know, quietly enjoyed it, um, but still, you know, passed on kudos to to my colleagues you know not the same when you don't um then you don't get to see people in person as much amazing that must have been a lot of fun um 
I would like to switch gears a little bit and learn more about you and your journey within STEM and engineering. How did you get in, involved uh, in engineering to begin with? And then how did you choose a career path within uh, energy and then subsequently energy efficiency? For sure, uh, Jerome. I could, good question. <laughs> so um, my journey, I would say, started off um, when I was a teenager um, back home in you know Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm actually originally from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm now now Canadian. And um, for myself, climate change at the time was really top of mind. It's part of the education. It's part of what you're hearing in news, and it's part of something that I saw every day. I was actually close to the water. You could see things happening to coral reefs in my in my lifetime, right? You could see garbage, you could see algae and that kind of thing. And just wanting to to learn more about it and wanting to do something. And so I kind of asked and I researched and I said, okay, well, you know, man, this climate change thing, it's a really complex problem. It's interwoven. There's so many, so many aspects to it. Who are people out there that solve complex problems? And I, that's how I stumbled across like the concept of an engineer. And I said, oh, that's really cool. That's that's what I want to be. And then that's how I started my journey to say, okay, let, let me find a, a way. Let me find, you know, a way to get into education where I could learn engineering. And then that kind of tied into the, ener- the energy space. Like no matter what we're doing, at, you know, right now, we're going to need energy. You know, there's certain, mm-hmm. there's certain things in, in life and in society that we just need. So we need to have a plan for sustainability along those lines for energy, how we use it, how we produce it. You know, we need to have a plan. And so I always thought, okay, between, you know, those fundamental skills that you need as an engineer that I'd want to be in this type of industry um, and be able to help, with, you know, in the larger picture of things. Great. Oh, wow. Uh, that's quite the, the journey. Uh, seeing change so close to home and then trying to do something about it um it's and that bringing you to canada it's a it's a great story um oh, one last thing i know that you're an osby member uh tell us why you're an osby member and some of the benefits of being a part of the community Okay, so we'll talk about the benefits in addition to the really good car insurance. Is I know I <laughs> a lot of people do talk about that. It's one of the first things you hear from people is like, oh, the good car insurance. But um, but in all honesty, I am an OSPI member because you know ed- education and being part of a community is really important to me. So the events, webinars, workshops over all of the years that I've been here, I, I was even you know an OSPI member before I was a professional engineer as a as a student. Those things have always helped me to grow as an engineer, to grow as a professional, and to grow as a member of society. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like we've learned so much today. Um, and uh, do you have any last closing thoughts that you'd like to uh, share with us before we wrap up? Absolutely. I do have a couple um, kudos and things that I do want to impart. Um One of the things like thinking about engineers, especially with this being National Engineering Month, is that engineers, you know, they're a part of maintaining systems and products and things that are so beneficial to society, and they often go unnoticed. And I want to say that, you know, perhaps that's one of the things that we need to continue to do is elevate for people that the things that we take for granted actually do um, revolve around a lot of important people. I want to thank my colleagues, for example, in the control room at the IESO, those people who are out there ensuring that electricity, that, you know, you have electricity when you need it and it's continuing to operate all the way through the pandemic. It's not a crisis. And, you know, it's not a part of the things that anyone has to think about. You go to your light switch and it turns on and it's there. But of course, if you went there one day and it didn't, <laughs> you'd be pretty upset. So, I mean, engineers make sure there isn't a crisis, right? We plan and maybe it's not as sexy, you know, or as intense as some of the other TV dramas, but it's important. Absolutely. 100%. Thank you so much. This has been a conversation with Kadra Branker, professional engineer and OSPI member responsible for program delivery at the Independent Electricity Systems Operator in Ontario.
From all of us at OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, thanks for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode.